Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And this one is one I've been wanting to do for a while, because when I started the Damcasters, I had a list of people I wanted to talk about. And in the sort of top five was Jerry Cobb. Now, Jerry was the most remarkable woman. In her 20s, she set multiple records. 1959, world record for non-stop long-distance flight. Also, the light plane speed record. And then an altitude record, 1960, where she took a light aircraft up to 37,000 feet. And she was the first of the Mercury 13, which was a phenomenal group of women that were brought in to see if they could pass the same tests as the Mercury 7. Filmmaker and now author Mary Haverstick wanted to make a movie about them and with Jerry as the star, because being the first and with the life Jerry led, it was the key. But when Mary started digging, she found that the life of Jerry Cobb was very much the lives of Jerry Cobb. And that all became the basis for her book, A Woman I Know, Female Spies, Double Identities and a New Story of the Kennedy Assassination. Yeah, it goes there. Now, in the podcast, we're going to be talking about Mary's relationship with Jerry and Jerry's life and what she uncovered along the way. Now, the specifics that lead to Dealey Plaza on the 22nd of November 1963, well, you're going to have to read the book about that. We're going to touch upon it, but we want you to read this because this really is a phenomenal read. You really have to get your hands on it and go into the rabbit hole that we all embarked upon. So my first question to Mary is really to start at that beginning point and ask when she went on this journey with Jerry at the start, did she think it was in the lead where it did? When you met Jerry Cobb, an aviator who all of us aviation fans have heard of through many of the ways, did you think you'd find yourself on a 10 year journey <laughs> following in the footsteps of Oliver Stone and many others into the Kennedy assassination? I had zero idea this might ever lead into espionage, the Kennedy assassination. I was very interested in aviation from an armchair perspective and NASA as a little girl who grew up, you know, admiring and almost worshiping the astronauts. I mean, you know, I remember the moon landing and waiting up way into the wee hours to see the grainy footage of Neil Armstrong and that first incredible step for mankind. And yeah. And then as a grown woman became very interested in the women's fight for equality mm. and the role that Jerry had played in that, you know, it was quite extraordinary. That's why I went after that story, a, a Jerry's story. And I realized the Mercury 13 story of all the women who really attempted to become astronauts was really, it needed to be told through the lens of Jerry Cobb because she really was the central player who had not only the first one to pass those astronaut tests, but then also the one to fight for women's rights to become an astronaut. She failed, but it was an incredible fight that she did, that she did undertake. One of my big regrets about reading your book is that the, the Mercury 13 movie didn't come off because mm. the, the, the way you describe it and the amount of research you were getting into just sounded absolutely fascinating. And that, that, that sort of group that, yes, we had the Netflix documentary, but they they need more and i guess yeah that, uh, well that no oh, wow maybe book two because i'll tell you i learned i mean i think a lot of people got marginal access to jerry because i think she would fire off an email to an author or they may have had a little tiny bit of access i had 10 years of access to this woman i learned so much about the mercury 13 and through no fault of the other authors i think quite a bit of what was told was either inadequate partial or really missed some things I'll tell you one thing right off the bat that has not made my book, because I had to move through the Mercury 13 stuff really quickly into what I believe to be Jerry's double identity and her spying career mm -hmm. and the Kennedy assassination. But Jerry told me that she had a spy. This is her first introduction. We, I didn't know about spying or her deal. We were in our interviews for the movie. When she said to me one day during our interviews, she said, I had a spy among the male astronauts, you know. And I just went, what what 
because I already <laughs> knew from what Jerry's stories were that she had crossed paths a lot more with the men than in the Mercury 13 books and, and documentaries. I mean, she was talking about seeing them, knowing them. She was at the various training. And I'm like, why is she crossing so much paths with the men? That's not what the other books said. And then she said she had a spy among the men. She wouldn't tell me who. Uh, and finally, I guessed, I mean, she started to give some information about it, that it was Deke Slayton. Now, he wind up very interestingly become of the head of the male astronauts. He sort of stepped out of it with his heart issue. She claims she was with him when he heard about the news that he wasn't going to be able to fly. I mean, she had a lot of proximity to the men that she was discussing with me, and she knew everything about the men's opinions. I mean, this is really just a really far-fetched guess, but if Jerry's a spy that I that, you know, believe I've uncovered, it brings up the potential for counter-espionage surveillance of the men, because if you think about it, we could not have the male astronauts just be guys with all that information without a bit of double checking for our government mm -hmm. that everybody was on the up and up or they weren't fraternizing with any Russian spies. And I have to wonder, June Cobb and her case officer were in counterintelligence. That's protecting our country from invasions from, you know, uh, you know, other intelligent like KGB coming at our people. And could they have been performing a security role? And could that be why she knows so much about Deke Slayton? And could Deke Slayton's role have been a bit of counterintelligence? There's a lot of information that I just told you that's not in my book that I'm really thrilled to get out there. That, that would be fascinating because, of course, you have the famous stories that Tom Wolfe uncovered with the, the cape cookies and the, the, the women, and that's prime yes, yes. honeypot sort of thing. So that, that, all, that all makes... A level of sense, doesn't it? Well, no offense to the male historians that come before me, but they're real interested in the honeypot angles, whereas I'm a little more interested in the rock'em, sock'em cowgirls that were in there doing some actual flying and some actual astronaut tests. So my interest went in quite a different direction there, and that's why I think I've found some different women's activities than maybe some of the male historians have uncovered. Let, let's get into this. I had so many questions. The, the outline I sent you is okay, the short we'll version because yep, yep. one of one of the, the, the lovely people that are one of my patron followers, I, I recommended this book as I was reading it. And his message to me was quite simply, what have you got me into? And <laughs> I suppose that was the same thing that you, that you fell into as well. But I, I, I just, yeah, sorry, go, go on. No, you go ahead. No, I was, I was just wanting to sort of start off by those early sort of interactions with Jerry because like you said mm -hmm. she she had contacted various people but there was something she saw in you that she was willing I I, I use open up advisedly but to connect with you that that led on the beginning of this journey my sense of it was that she may have been at the age where she was looking for someone to talk to a bit in a greater length. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she, that was my sense of it because somewhere in one of my early emails, I think she said, you know, Jerry or Ruth, who was really Jerry emailing me back said, you know, she's going to be talking to three people and pick one to talk to. She, she was almost looking, she may have been vetting and seeing who was coming on her radar screen. And maybe I was at the right time right place. I'm not really sure how all that aligned. I mean, I'm now that I know about espionage and how things can happen, I, you know, I don't take anything quite at face value like I used to. But certainly, Jerry was, I think, looking for someone that she would pull into her orbit. I think you couldn't pull a New York Times reporter in because that person's going to be on deadline and cannot spend 10 years like I did. Yeah, I think I was the perfect person um, because, uh, you know, a smaller indie filmmaker who could keep my career going all the while staying hooked into trying to unspool her story. So she almost needed someone like me who wasn't too big or too small, but right in that sweet spot. The journey, I, I'm, I'm looking at my questions and my brain is still going, how? Because this is, we, we're going to mm. go into the, the epic rabbit hole you found yourself in. Mm. But I'm, I was intrigued by your approach to the research. So as, as a filmmaker, when you're getting into a historical film that started out with Mercury 13, Jerry as the central figure on that, how do you go about starting to pull that information together? Because historians will start delving into archives and things like that. For you as a filmmaker, looking at it from a visual point of view, is that process any different or is it just gather as much as you can and then start sifting your way through it? 
So as a filmmaker, I would have previously told you that, you know, I was going to rely on other historians, people who were real historians, right, who had written the books previously. And so my first approach was to read everything that had been written about Jerry of the Mercury 13. Jerry had written some autobiographies way mm -hmm. back. Um, and go, sift through all that material, and I didn't feel the need to redo that material. Now, I think the great filmmakers, for histor historical filmmakers like Ken Burns, they go into, you know, those, you know if they're going to do Ben Franklin, they go into the original materials and that kind of thing. But the kind of level story I was doing was going to focus on getting Jerry herself talking to her, hearing her emotional journey, her biography from the horse's mouth, and then synthesizing that into a screenplay. So for me, landing Jerry was really important because this was going to be telling her vision of the Mercury 13, and then also reading up what the other historians had written. That was really uh, probably all I was really planning to do with heavily weighting her story. And that really was what I did to develop my screenplay. So for those who may not have heard of her, what is the conventional sort of public story that we know about Jerry Cobb? Because that yeah. in of itself is just fascinating before we get into everything that we're going to be chatting about. Yeah, when, when when she died, she got a, you know, almost a full page, uh, you know, obituary in the New York Times. And it told the story because that's how important it was. Mm -hmm. And it was that she had been this great pilot, but women didn't have that many piloting opportunities. She wrote, you know, business plane records and twin engine craft and that kind of thing. But those are secondary to like jet records. And she uh, had... Become, you know, got asked at an Air Force conference by a couple of guys that knew she was a good pilot, NASA doctors, to say, can, let's test a woman. The Russians have some women in their program. Let's see what women can do in America. And they tested Jerry, and she passed the same physical kind of, they're sort of psychological pressure tests and physical uh, ability tests. And she passed those with flying colors to the shock of the 1960 doctors who assumed the, the male pilots mm -hmm. would just do so much better. But you know, women do have some pretty good advantages in things like endurance. Um, you know, there are a number of pain tolerance. There are a number of areas where women really excel, and that came through in the tests. So once Jerry passed, they brought other women on board. Jerry helped to see was Jerry an anomaly, and ultimately these 13 women called the Mercury 13 were the ones that passed the tests. But there was no way to put them through to become astronauts. We had our Mercury 7. They were training to fly. So Jerry took it upon herself to really start to do that fight for equality. She took it to the you know, vice president's desk. She took it to Congress in a congressional hearing. She ultimately lost the right for women to become astronauts. The time wasn't right. John Glenn himself, very sadly, came in and kind of torpedoed the women with some not so comments that haven't held up very well historically. Um, and, you know, so the women didn't get to fly, of course, until we know Sally Ride made her first flight for America. Uh, now, uh, Valentina Cherishkova, of course, did fly for the mm -hmm. Russians while Jerry was making her push very interestingly. So that's the story that I was trying to tell. When Jerry lost her bid, she went off to the Amazon jungle, so the legend goes, and did charity work flying supplies into indigenous people in the jungle. And when I reached out to Jerry, she was saying that she was still in the jungle flying. And that's the story I was told that I would have to meet her when she came back to America. And I have unspooled that as not truthful at that, by that point. And I'm not even sure how much, uh, I believe quite a bit of her Amazon story, while parts are true, quite a bit is overblown. Um, you know, it's to a great extent a cover story, as was part certainly her part, some of her part of the Mercury 13 was a cover story for her as well, for espionage. So I guess the big question is, when do those stories start to diverge from your research starting to find these gaps in Jerry's life that don't quite marry up? What, what was that sort of golden bullet moment for you when you thought, uh-oh, this isn't working? I'd love to say I'm the genius who saw through it from day one, but had I not <laughs> been visited by a federal agent, a woman I thought I met by happenstance, and I described this briefly in the book, but at the beginning of the book, but I was visited by a woman in the Department of Defense who told me she was in espionage, and I thought she was just a cool person I'd met. She started to warn me about the film, though, and then she visited my office and said that my documents I had about Jerry were classified and needed to be in a vault. I don't even know if that had any bearing. I don't think that was true, but I think I was getting 
I started to realize I was being warned about something. Mm -hmm. At least that's my interpretation. I'm sure this woman would say, oh, you're all wet. I, you know, she could deny it. And she left my life never to be seen. So I was left like, wow, was I getting warnings from a woman in espionage about my movie? This is very strange. So I simply Googled Jerry Cobb and CIA together, and up came this woman named June Cobb. The problem was that I knew Jerry's biography, you know, hook, line, and sinker. I knew the whole thing. Here comes this other woman on Google really quickly. Her biography had just way too many similarities to Jerry's. And it was only a matter of hours before I was like, whoa, is this woman her twin, her sister, her what? Are they the same? What am I looking at? But furthermore, the reason I could find out so much about June Cobb is because there were thousands of pages about the spy June Cobb for the CIA spy in the Kennedy assassination saga. And so that is where I started to marry up. Oh, wow. June Cobb has these incredible similarities biograph, the same hometown, Ponca City. I call it uh, Oklahoma. I, I call the similarities the astonishing list of similarities. And in chapter two of the book, A Woman I Know, I lay them out. And I mean, just even after hearing those, you know something's terribly wrong with this thing, right? And so that began a 10-year quest uh, and of course, immediately confronting Jerry, because I was working with her, uh, lining up a meeting to say, what's wrong with this picture? And what's wrong? Are you June Cobb? So that's what set me off on a 10 year quest to find out who Jerry Cobb really was. Who was this June Cobb? And why were all these files tangled up with the Kennedy assassination? And it became, of course, like you mentioned, a crazy rabbit hole that I spent far too much time in. But you know, I'm glad I did. Okay, so what was that feeling like when it you start looking to June Cobb and it goes straight to the Kennedy assassination? Was there a moment where you thought, oh, not this? Or well, I couldn't did, believe it. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, imagine, you know, furthest thing from my mind, and I think if you can tell hopefully this far into this interview that, yeah, I hadn't really spent any time even on spies, double identities, or any, you know, even watch spy movies, or certainly not the Kennedy assassination. I'm not really a conspiracy person. So for all those reasons, it was like, why me? You know, but when you dig into it, it is pretty fascinating, right? And there are questions about the Kennedy assassination that have lingered for all Americans forever. I mean, we've been pretty fascinated by the holes in the official story. I think all Americans know there are some problems there. What are they? What do they mean? We don't all agree on that. But there seems to be a lot of problems with the Warren Commission. And now I'm meeting a woman who's hiding a double identity, and she's so public, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And it, the reason I spent so much time on it, if you just presented me with, oh, here, you're going to go down the rabbit hole of the Kennedy assassination for years, I'd be like, no way. But I knew this woman. I mean, I met a person who looked like they had the double identity with this person in the Kennedy files and a spy. That's just way too fascinating to come across your transom and not get hooked in by, right? So that's why I went down a rabbit hole. Not It was the personal element, which is reflected, I think, in the, in the title of the book, A Woman I Know. I, I stuck to what I knew. I was dealing with her. Um, and so, yeah, chapter one of my book is, I almost word for word tell you my confrontation of what it was like to sit and confront Jerry and say, are you June Cobb? And she kind of said, oh, you know, no. And then it'd be like, yeah, but here's what, how do you explain this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And to look her in the eye and to see what she said um, and, and what her answers weren't, <laughs> weren't helpful in getting me off that trail. So yeah, the whole thing just got deeper, deeper, deeper. Now, dear listener, I'm going to interject here by saying I've specifically tried not to ask too many Kennedy assassination questions because I want you to read the book because it it the the way you've structured it, Mary, starting starting at Redbird and, and ending up at, at Redbird as well, airports, read the book, it all becomes clear. Um, I didn't want to sort of spoil that aspect. I just wanted to sort sure. of pick pick bits of, of of Jerry's life. So, dear listener, if you're expecting us to sort of break down everything. Mary wrote in the book. You're wrong because we want you to buy the book because it's it is fab. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and my dear wife had to put up with me going what the hell quite often in bed at night <laughs> and having to sort of read her sections because it's it's mad, in a good way, not as in mad as in mad mad. That's terrible. But no, I I'm with you on that. <laughs> totally. So let's let's start picking this apart a bit because 
the the bit I found very fascinating is that connection back in Ponca City in, in, in Oklahoma, because in your book, you sort of look at what the then OSS predecessor of the CIA was doing with recruiting women in intelligence and also women pilots as well, because we've talked yep. on the show many times about the Commonwealth training schemes and the, the US training schemes for, for many pilots coming across from Canada and Britain and things like that. Yes. What was happening in Oklahoma when, when Jerry and June were both coming up? Because they seem to have been swept up into a very interesting program. They did. So, but, you know, June, both June Cobb, June had a history in aviation. Yeah, she was involved in the Civil Air Patrol. And we're not all sure of all her connections, but she definitely was in aviation very early. So this would be the 50s, as was Jerry. And of course, they're both in Ponca City and Norman, Oklahoma. So two relatively small towns. So in Ponca City, which they both claimed as a hometown in the 1950s, uh, it was actually World War II where June would have lived there and Jerry didn't quite live there yet. But where, where the Dar School of Aviation was a big deal, the Brits were looking for ways to safely train their pilots on safe ground. And America chipped in. We weren't in the war yet, but we said, we will help put your pilots through training with some of our people who will be helpful and, you know, here in a safe place in Oklahoma. I believe there were maybe four or five, your listeners are probably sharper on this than me, but there were a bunch of those DAR schools of Oklahoma mm -hmm. in America at the time, Ponca City being one of the biggest, but they needed a counterintelligence program to make sure that there weren't German spies giving us a problem at that base, right? So what they did and how I know this is not because of June Cobb. June Cobb has a stepsister who was in intelligence. And I found this out by getting an oral history interview that I found at a small little museum in Oklahoma where she spoke about her career. She was also a lady pilot, but she was trained in piloting and uh, the link trainer, which you're, some of your folks are yep. probably also familiar with. So they they taught her in the link trainer so that she could train some of the troops so she could then socialize with the troops and learn if there were any problems with German spies. That's what she was looking for. So there was this development of women's aviation as a protective layer around this DAR school of aviation. And this woman who was June Cobb's stepsister is one of the earliest women. She actually sued our government for back pay. So we know she was trying to say, hey, I was even before the OSS, I was in intelligence. And she wanted to be credited for that and compensated for that. So it's on the record that she did this. Well, that opens the door because that's the airport that Jerry's flying in. That's where June's at the Civil Air Patrol. And we obviously can see this pathway now for women to get into both aviation and be trained in aviation while simultaneously also being trained for spying. And I think that's why we're seeing these women come out of this Ponca City area. And they come out of this area and then again, they start to cross paths at points that yes. are too regular for them to be coincidence. Well, let's taste it. When you have a woman who is trained in spying and she's also able to be an aviator. Now, that's a really good talent to have if you're a spy, and especially if you're a spy who has multiple identities. And that's how spies roll, right? They have a multiple identity. Well, you have one of their lady spy identities that doesn't fly. So she's harmless. She can't go anywhere. Meanwhile, she just changes her skirt into the other lady, and she can fly off to see her case officer or any other operation that she's on can fly back in. This is just an incredible skill to have for a spy. Yeah. And if you think about how wonderfully elegant it is to have a lady spy have this skill in 1960, you can just see how this just opens up the world to her to be completely invisible, completely non-threatening, and she has her plane and she can fly around. So I found a number of women who were both uh, aviators and spies. It's a magical combination and it's a powerful combination if you're fighting a war. I was going to bring that up at the end, but as we've mentioned, the other lady, yes. Betty Lusser, who, when you look yes. her up, her CIA profile literally says the intrepid woman. Yeah. And it's the most incredible, incredible story. And also after reading your book, 
rather familiar as well. Sure. I was trying to figure out, like, okay, let's see, are there any other authors or people who have discovered this pathway that I'm seeing from aviation to spying and all this overlap for women? It was really, I'm, I was convinced this was, you know, definitely something that was being, uh, you know, utilized. And I came across this Betty Lussier. So she was a very young American. I think she was even too young to get into World War II the, the correct way. So she somehow had dual citizenship, got over to England and got into the ATA. So she was able to deliver planes for the ATA over with the Brits. So she was flying and she was serving in the war. And they recruited her from there into the OSS, where she went into what? Counterintelligence, just like I'm talking about, where, and she got in our elite counterintelligence, right? Now, I don't really know a whole lot about what she wound up getting into for her spying, because some of that stuff's highly classified. But that puts her in the orbit of like, James Engleton and June Cobb's bosses. So I've concluded that when the government finds a good pathway and something that works and same for our military, they use it over and over again, right? So, um, you know, this should lead us into what could be a connective tissue between all these women, which could be Jackie Cochran. So mm -hmm. I think we should bring her up because talk about a woman who is an aviator, but is deeply connected in our military intelligence at the time and was really a high roller and a big player is Jackie Cochran. Jackie comes up regularly on this podcast and I've never covered her specifically because, she, well, mainly because she comes up as, as regularly as we, we've, we've had um, Eileen Bjorkman talking about her Jackie essentially torpedoing woman flying aircraft for the U S air force in the, in the fifties and sixties and things. When she popped up in your book, I was happy, not surprised and intrigued to see what she was going to get up to. And yeah. how does Jackie fall into this story as well? Jackie comes into the story in multiple ways, which are fascinating. I mean, first of all, if your, your listeners probably know she was uh, married to a very wealthy mm. Floyd Oldham. So she, she had the bucks, she had the access to the, you know, Chuck Yeagers of the world, but she ran the wasps, which your listeners also probably mm -hmm. know, but that put her in touch with like Hap Arnold and all these big, you know, high flyers, literally and figuratively, right? She was toured. This is how high her access was. You know, when the Hitler bunker was a big trophy that people, when there's Jackie was in the Hitler bunker. She was flown over Hiroshima right after the bomb so she could survey the damage. I mean, this is a person who was given tremendous access because of her contributions. I have been long suspicious that part of her job at the WASPs was to also look for women for the OSS because the OSS needed women. And you know, if they could just get some gals in there that could also fly a plane. Lussier had approached Jackie Cochran, Betty Lussier. I mm -hmm. went to the archives and found a letter where Lussier contacted her. And I also know that uh, at least I've pieced together that what I believe to be June Cobb's case officer was also a wasp. So that links June Cobb over to the Jackie Cochran circle. And then most importantly, Jackie Cochran financed the Mercury 13. She was extraordinarily tight with Dr. Lovelace and General Flickinger, who were doing the male astronaut tests. And she financed the other women, supposedly not Jerry, but all those 12 that followed Jerry. So this is starting to link her. And you know, I mean, I cannot prove this, but I'm very suspicious that you know, she was very highly placed. And I, if there was a cover story in play, it would shock me that Jackie would be financing something that she wasn't fully apprised, that there was another level, because I think she was read in on a lot. You don't get in the Hitler bunker uh, for being just a, a philanthropist. Um, you know, you're, you're somebody who is very, very dialed into what's going on. Utterly fascinating woman. And the I'm as as you are convinced, there's far more to come out about her over the over the years. One can but start by the to way, become uh, she herself, oh. uh, <laughs> with this is a real bummer. She herself trashed many of the wasp files, and only mm. you know the files we have now from the wasp are the ones that she didn't throw out. So she did a big cleanse of her own files. But of course, that we get the little files that we do have. So there, there's that. Yeah. It, <sighs> I think calling her complex doesn't really give do her justice because, like I said, she's someone that I've often wanted to do 
a specific episode on, but figuring out how to approach her for the, you know, on one hand, you have the Bendix Trophy winner, you have all, all of that stuff pre-war, you have the very complex person af afterwards. And, and it, it, it added with your elements now, it makes it even well, more murky. The, the, the listeners might be interested to know that she was one of the ones, along with John Glenn, she sided with Glenn that the women mm -hmm. should not go forward with the astronaut program. Of course, I've wondered if she knew there was a spy component, maybe she knew that wasn't its purpose. Maybe the purpose yeah. was to wrap this thing up and get it off the stage. So she's been interpreted by history that she kind of shot our own sisters in the heart, you know, and delayed us be to become astronauts. When in fact, she might have been protecting, if she was read in on any espionage component of the Mercury 13, she very well could have been just following the script. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Here we are with the Pima Air and Space Museum's Learjet Model 23. The Model 23 was Learjet's first small business jet. This one was owned by the Timken family of uh, Ohio, the Timken ball bearings. They were a company that made well-known ball bearings for all different types of machinery. Louise Timken was the matriarch of the family and she was the first woman to get a jet pilot's license here in the United States for the Learjet. Um, she had gotten a license for a smaller uh, like four seat jet beforehand. Um, the zebra skin inside on the seats was from a zebra that she shot in safari back in the day. They uh, flew this aircraft uh, for many years before, uh, or after they had moved out and retired out here to Arizona, they uh, finally at one point stopped flying the airplane and they donated it here to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Also on display in our Women in Flight exhibit is a red visor and red shoes that she always wore when she was flying this airplane. Um, over the years, Louise Simpkin, you know, has gotten many awards for just, you know, being who she was, you know, in Ohio and here in Arizona. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.com. Org. For more information, and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now, back to the show. We, we've mentioned her quite a bit so far, but let, let's talk specifically about JuneCon. And yes. That life, because in, in your book, you do some fantastic um, checkerboarding and, and sort of marking out of where yeah. Jerry is, June is, and other women as well who are desperately wanted to talk about but it'll just get a bit tricky to to make it all work in, in a podcast but let's talk about june and that sort of life that we've sort of mentioned with her in oklahoma as well um in the her flying and then those intersectings how did you start timelining the two of them because that's where you had me in this book when i was starting to be able to see the minutia that you're able to start showing the crossover of these these two ladies well thank you for that compliment matt uh one of the reasons i mean i was trying to figure out is jerry are jerry and june the same person mm -hmm. and then the the, the, the the actual question became more narrow is jerry the person who is described in these cia files as june because i found there is another lady named june to complicate the matter um, that doesn't look like Jerry and all that. But the narrow question is, did Jerry, is that name used for Jerry in the CIA file? That's the only thing we need to know. So I took June's CIA file, which is, you know, I don't know if it's 10,000 pages, but it's many thousands of pages at the National Archives, which I copied, I date indexed them, and I started to plot on a graph where June was. Now, how naive I was, I thought I might be able to solve if they're the same person in a matter of weeks, you know, just plotting them <laughs> on a graph, right? 10 years later, it's actually inconclusive. Jerry Cobb was in the news. I had her memorabilia in her letters, so I could peg her an astounding number of days where she was. I mean, I would peg her when there's a picture of her in Dallas or DC. And then June Cobb would be getting a cable in Havana on a certain day, or her case officer phoned her and there was an instruction or wired money here or there. So I could piece together where they were. And I started to do this literally on a daily basis from October 1st, 1960. Where are June and Jerry? What I learned on the timeline was 
June would be active for this period of time in the timeline. And I started to call this checkerboarding. And then June would disappear for her, from her side. And then, oh, over here pops Jerry a few days later often, and she would become active on her part of the timeline, and then she would pop out. And sometimes they'd even have a kind of phony excuse, like Jerry needed wisdom tooth surgery, so she's out of the picture. Now June comes back. This just went on, and it wasn't able, the one thing you were looking for is can you get one time where they're you know, Jerry's photographed here and June is absolutely on an assignment in Africa or somewhere else. And I couldn't get that proof, like after thousands of data points. <laughs> so it, the, the checkerboarding, and then they, they both moved through the same cities. I mean, you could watch their pattern, Miami to, to, to Cuba to, you know, and they were moving in the same synchronous way. This person didn't have a home base. So all of that, I think started to really fortify my instinct that that this was one person. Because the the places they go and the people they intersect with is just a who's who's of fifties and sixties. Uh, it, it politics is politics and everything. Yeah. And you know, yes, yes, you have the Harvey Oswald element later on, but Castro, all the stuff that was going on in Mexico City at the time. We'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about the the wider cryptonymic assassination program if that's what you want to call it in a second but it they knew or interacted with everybody and we are not mm. using that pejorative we literally do mean everybody you you want to talk about castro these are your ladies to talk about yep well, June Cobb was targeting Castro. Now, you have to think about in the Cold War, that had to be one of the most premier spy jobs mm -hmm. for anybody, right? If you're, you know, you don't put your second best on Fidel Castro. Yep. And June Cobb was targeting Castro. She was in Cuba, and June Cobb sent materials into the assassin who the CIA has admitted that we'd lined up to try to poison mm -hmm. Castro. So June Cobb was on some very dark operations. And I think regardless of what people think about Jerry, do you know, is she June? This June Cobb is a fascinating individual who should have been looked mm. at a lot longer and sooner. So June Cobb was an amazing spy. And and Castro, you know, she was trying to, you know, get rid of our enemies, basically, you know, do whatever it took. And she was fearless. I mean, June Cobb is sometimes written off in the file like a little nothing burger, like just, you know, oh, kind of a gadfly that's interested in communist dictators. And then you realize she's after his scalp in there maneuvering with, his, you know, working for the head of the assassination program of our country and trying to get Castro out of there. So she was and she she would have been taken before a firing squad for that. I mean, mm -hmm. had she been caught, she would have been killed. So whoever June Cobb is, she's extraordinarily brave and she is in there under the nose of Castro. Now, it took me a long time because Jerry Cobb never, I want to be clear, she never directly admitted to being June. As a matter of fact, she would always technically deny it. But if you read the book and you see her denials, you will see how they were loaded with her clue, giving me clues that, yeah, she may well be June Cobb, including as soon as I confronted her about being June Cobb, Jerry Cobb asks me to travel the world with her to destinations of her choosing, which were all June Cobb's spy operational zones, like going to Mexico, going to the Caribbean. Jerry wanted to all of a sudden take me to all those places so that I'd be familiar with it. Um, so, yeah. And then eventually, Jerry did tell me she just couldn't hold it back after I had gone to Cuba and I was telling her about what it was like to be in Cuba, Jerry finally blurted out that she knew Fidel Castro, Jerry Cobb. She told me this. I had known her probably eight years, nine years. This was a late in the game admission. And by that time, Jerry knew that I knew a whole lot about her and that I'd been long investigating June and Jerry made that admission. We should also let your listeners know that it, within the book, I did finally uh, find a witness who knew June Cobb. And when I presented that witness with pictures of Jerry and June and some other ladies, she pointed to Jerry Cobb's two pictures and, and, and cited that the woman she knew as June Cobb, she was pointing to Jerry's pictures. So that was a, a positive ID. So I, so I have that going for me. Oh, there's so many questions on this. I'm going to stick to the script. I'm going to stick to the script. <laughs> okay. Let, let's talk about that assassination program because yeah. I, I've, I've read in the past about what was happening in, in Africa at the time, which you, you mm. look at in with, um, Congo, Zaire, that, that sort of period as well. What was happening? Because this is a tumultuous time with massive geopolitics trying to get these emerging nations on one side 
of the curtain or the other. What was the CIA up to? Because you yeah. get very used to crypt cryptonyms and crypt crypto hidden characters sure. in your book. So oh, what, I, what, what, what was what was going on? Explain it to me. Well, the big picture is, you know, uh, Castro came to power in 59, I believe it was January 1. And our country had a little bit of hope that he would be an improvement over the other guy. Uh, and, and he, you know, he quickly wasn't. Uh, he quickly sided with the Russians who were helping to fuel him financially and in other ways. And the big concern was, and it bore out, that Cuba was turning communist. And this was a real problem in America because they're right over that close shore and they the 30 minute flight and boy, they can put missiles, which they were trying to eventually do in 62, Russian missiles. I mean, this could mean just dire consequences in the Cold War for America. So at that time and under those terrible circumstances, a uh, faction of our country decided that it would be probably worthwhile to try to get rid of Castro and unseat him by any means necessary, including the Bay of Pigs and including assassination. That's long been studied by other historians far more on it than me. But what they didn't look at, what the other historians didn't look at, unfortunately, was June Cobb's role, because it was June Cobb who was being maneuvered. There are 70 some documents. I think she was overlooked as a woman of no consequence. She was belittled often in the file. But she was the one who was in contact with the assassin, the first assassin, who was supposed to try to poison Castro in concert with or just before the Bay of Pigs. So if you topple him and then you get the Bay of Pigs going, you really put the whole island in crisis and maybe we would have won that. Um, that wound up being foiled at that attempt. But that's who you're looking at with June Cobb, someone who's completely fearless and ruthless. Now, let me just add that I knew Jerry Cobb. I was spending by this time a lot of time with Jerry. And the thing about Jerry, and I've met other cool women who do, I'm a filmmaker myself. I think I do something cool with you know cameras and equipment. I've met some other pilots, but Jerry was something else. Uh, she was a bit of a hard boiled egg. In some ways I say that positively, but there's another side. She was tough, uh, real tough. And I think Jerry was also ruthless. Um, I sensed that from her even in our first meeting. And I was actually a bit surprised by that about her. I was surprised with that characteristic. She had a real edge to her. She was a very strong woman. She was, frankly, a woman to be feared, not to be trifled with. Um, and she was a woman of consequence. And she also did not carry with her much in the way of empathy, sympathy, many of things we think of women, maternal, caring. The, she did not offer me a drink of water in the many interviews we did. I mean, this was not a nurturing person. This was like, we're going to sit here and do this interview, you know, straight up. I think she became very fond of me in her own way, but uh, she was a, she was a tough, uh, a tough gal. One of the stories that jumped out at me was your eclipse story and having mm -hmm. just been another eclipse. Yeah. I, I found that interaction very telling in, you just mentioned her drive and her determination for it that determination to see the eclipse but at the same time take you on an odd road trip shall we call it mm -hmm. i thought that was a, a very interesting part of the, the story that you were telling where she um was again trying it, it felt like or you put across it she was trying to feed you something yeah. and yet maybe knock you off the scent at the same time it, it was it was a very odd interaction mm. that you, you described very well. I think by that time she was mm. figuring I probably had a lot of information. I, the eclipse was my last trip with Jerry. We traveled mm. internationally all over the place to Spain, to Cuba, to Mexico. Oh, we didn't go to Cuba, pardon me, to the Caribbean. We mm. floated on a cruise ship all around Cuba. Um, so we did a road trip to an eclipse in Missouri and she was so frail. She was very old and yet she could still muster. I mean, I have relatives and friends who've, you know, very old and frail. I've never seen any of them rouse themselves to make a trip like that in the condition Jerry did. This is the kind of willpower that this woman had. She should not have been out. She should, she could have been in an assisted living or a care facility, but she was out getting on a road trip to see this eclipse. And she made it. She wasn't going to let anything stop her. And she was still dropping some clues for me. You're absolutely right. But this was also my ending with Jerry, frankly. The eclipse was the last time that I had a real trip and an interaction in that way. I had one last trip when she was far, you know, near her uh, retreating to her bed for her final passing. But 
that trip was very emotional for me because I'd spent a lot of time with Jerry. Um, but yes, yeah, she was still, she wanted to see it at Amelia Earhart's birthplace in Kansas. Um, she wanted to see it at this place where there was a moon tree, which is a seed planet by brought back from the moon from an astronaut and planted in our soil and the tree grows. She wanted to see the eclipse from there. So as hard boiled as Jerry was, she did still have a poetic streak somewhere inside her. Um, but um, yeah, that's a moving trip for me because it was really my last real connection with Jerry. I, I guess the, the obvious question, or the stupid question, depending <laughs> on how you want to frame it, do you think she wanted you to figure it out? Do, do you generally think, yeah, yeah it, was, I do. it was, yeah. Well, you can imagine how many sleepless nights I've had asking myself that question, <laughs> right? I mean, if she didn't, well, I believe very, very deeply, if she didn't want me to know anything, I mean, this woman is smart enough. First of all, forget it if she's not even in espionage. Let's just say she's Jerry Cobb, the aviator. She was very skilled at blowing everybody off if she didn't want to talk to them. So she had every skill set in the world to get rid of me, right? She just didn't. When the Aviation Hall of Fame tried to induct, well, they did induct her, uh, forget the year, it might have been 2015, 16. Anyway, they inducted her into that hall. They sent the astronauts to call her. They had Eileen Collins calling her, please come to this. <laughs> Jerry would not come to it, and she wouldn't even answer those people. So when I contacted, she said, oh, Mary, be a, go on my friends list and you can attend. When I contacted the Aviation Hall, the head of the entire outfit was like, are you kidding me? You're in touch with this woman? Like, we cannot get astronauts to get her. No, she won't answer. Like, we can't get him. We've never had. They literally said to me the words, Neil Armstrong came to our event. Like, everybody comes to our event. <laughs> Nobody blows this off, but Jerry's not coming, and she doesn't even talk to us. So it was then that I realized what a recluse she was and how weird it was that I'd broken through. But absolutely, I believe that she was dropping, oh, I believe she loved dropping these breadcrumbs to me about June Cobb and espionage and where June had been and Fidel Castro, but she did not do so overtly. So if Jerry had a secrecy agreement, I think she could probably say, with the exception of that Castro admission, she could probably go to her grave and feel like she hadn't really violated it with me. So you've been on this incredible journey. The books mm -hmm. come out. You've now whipped us all into this journey as well, which is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. How do you feel about Jerry now, looking mm. back on this this odyssey? I, I'm guessing very <sighs> conflicted. I, I can't help but, well, you know, I say it at the end of the book, and I'd probably write it more eloquently than I can ever say here. She asked, she was worried if I liked her. Once I discovered a mm. lot about her, she was worried how I felt about her. I'm not a good faker, so I couldn't fake a friendship that I, I didn't feel something there. But I also feel that... I was dealing with a mirage that Jerry, it's not like an actress. I've, I've directed great actresses. I've directed Marsha Gay Harden, who has an Oscar. Mm -hmm. But Jerry wasn't exactly an actress. It must be what a spy is like, because she projected a projection of who she was that was not completely accurate. She showed me parts of herself, but not the whole. She concealed a lot. Um, and of course, I liked a lot of what I saw, I disliked some of what I saw because I was a bit scared of her. She was very imposing. But, um, you know, I'm left with fondness when I think of her not being here. And yet, I believe she did some very dark deeds. Like, I, in the end game, and when you judge someone by their actions, it, she's very concerning. And I came to some very troubling conclusions about where she placed herself with JFK and the assassination on the day of. I have real problems and struggles there. But... When I just look at my heart and when I spent time with her and the fact that, of course, I always admire a, a woman who's exceptional, you know, amazing, interesting, layered, right? She was fascinating. Um, but I think behind that, boy, there was a lot of dark material and dark matter and she was not warm. Then that's, that's a problem. Mm. The, the title of the book's A Woman I Know. Do you feel you know her as well as anybody could? I do. That was her final words to me. She said she told me more than she told anyone in her entire life. That was her actual parting words as we parted when she was pretty much retreating to her deathbed. And I mean, I can just tell from who she was, she did not speak of her life, right? And the only way you could find out about her life was, I believe, in the National Archives trying to look up pseudonyms and operations that she may have conducted. 
And when I did that, and I think I'm the only person who was crazy enough to go dig all that up and go on that trail. <laughs> yes. And then I, you know, had certain times I confronted her. So she knew I knew quite a bit, probably too much, but you know, yeah. And I think she ultimately, I mean, I, you know, I've again struggled with this in my heart, but I do believe the whole reason she was dealing with me was to breadcrumb this deeper mm -hmm. story out without leaving her fingerprint on it so she could kind of technically stick to an oath that she may have done for the government. But yeah, I, I believe with all my heart that she did want me to tell the story. Well, we even have one big argument in the book where I, we kind of came to that conclusion and she more or less said that, that I was you know there to get her story out. I love the book. I've been recommending uh -huh. it to everybody I, I, I can because it's, it's not Thank often... You. Oh, I, trust me, if it's not good, I don't tell anybody about it and I don't have them on the podcast. But it's it's yeah, it's sitting here and it's one I've delved back into as well when things have popped into my head. Um, you know, watching your fantastic sort of collage of the, the, the various Kennedy assassination things with the mm. publish. Dear listener, you, all the links for all of that great stuff are going to be in, in the description below. But I did want to just ask, having mm. completed this 10-year odyssey with jerry possibly june too you've been on another odyssey with your new project which i wanted to ask you about about uh, what's it tipping point pa is is yeah thanks about. for asking and it it, it, yeah. it looks fascinating especially given the world as it is at the moment can you just tell us a little bit about it because it looks really exciting yeah i mean i think we all know the divisions in our country that are going on right now that are just so difficult you know the right the left the fighting that you know we're polarized to the gills and here i live in pennsylvania in central pennsylvania where those divisions are like you know literally like the old civil war and families and people believing different things and so i started to cover initially i started to cover a progressive candidate a very young woman who was in the kind of bernie mold but her family we're all voting for Trump. And what did that look like inside a family? And my documentary started to look at our state and I started to look at grassroots races and take a look at how that was playing out in people's lives, because it's certainly not simple. You know, it's a complicated picture. And Pennsylvania and central Pennsylvania in particular is just playing it out on a grand stage and trying to do so as much as can be done without just pure judgment from a political or a partisan look but a human look at who the people are who are in this fight. How are they feeling when they're, you know, these divisions are emerging in the family? How are they navigating that with love or, or not? So, so that's the, the documentary that I've been filming. It's not gonna conclude until we see really who wins in 2024, which I think is gonna be a big moment for our country and uh, even internationally a huge moment. This has been fantastic, Mary. Thank you so much for taking a, a bit of your, your lunchtime and for, doing this and thanks thanks michelle for all the audio help earlier as well oh, that's Matt, a thank question you. what what has michelle thought about all this oh she's been on well initially she was wary i mean when the when the news came that the, uh, we weren't going to do the astronaut film because i said uh oh i don't know if it's totally true uh, mm -hmm. it's true ish but there's more to it and it's not on a solid foundation if she has a double identity so michelle and all my film friends and everybody was like you know don't go down this JFK rabbit hole. Don't go down the double identity <laughs> rabbit hole. But I just couldn't help myself. But I pulled others along with me because eventually I think it got too darn fascinating. Mm. And so, yeah, I think the fascination of the story and June Cobb and who she was and Jerry and who she was um, just won everybody over. So, yeah, and in the end, got the book published and got the story out there. So who to thunk it? Mm, 100%. I, I, I am one of those people you have have dragged along with you and thank no. you very much for that and again thank you so much for spending the time with us here on the show thank you matt we really appreciate it i cannot thank mary haverstick enough for joining us here on the damn casters and i think you will agree that was quite something jerry's life as we know it was remarkable jerry's life as mary has uncovered it is truly truly fascinating so please go out and get the book a woman I know. It's available from all good and evil bookshops, including if you're here in the UK from the Damcasters Bookshop online. Links will be in the description for all of that. Also, if you want to support the pod in other ways, like, subscribe, pop some stars in the podcast app of your choice. Leaving a review is great as well, as that helps our AI overlords to share the pod far and wide. 
If you fancy being a little bit more direct, getting involved with the damn Castiers enables you to have these episodes early, different intros and outros to the audio version, and chat. And we're going to be chatting about this one quite a bit, because one of our damn Castiers, John, when I said I was reading this, read this book, and there's been conversation. So check out the link in the description below. Our Patreon just starts at £3 a month, plus a bit of that. We'd love to have you. And we can have lots of fun stuff. We've got our Zoom social coming up on the 11th of May with our special guest and also Dan Kistier, Dr. Philip Blood. So do check that out. But thank you so much for joining us. Get Mary's book. It's, it is ace. It really, really is. But I'm honest when I say I keep delving into it. My wife is going to take it with us on holiday. So I think I've lost her for that holiday once she gets stuck into this. It's that good. Until next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.